participants and my dear students for an interactive session on exploring career through NASA STEM engagement program. So when I say it is a STEM engagement program, it is an initiative by NASA for the students who are aspiring to have a career in the uh, highest and prestigious uh, organization, NASA in USA. Established in 1983, Bharati Vidya Pit, deemed to be University College of Engineering Pune, has been consistently ranked among top 100 institutions of India by NIRF, that is National Institutional Ranking Framework by Government of India, consecutively for last five years. Its inception was in 2015, so since its inception, our institute is proudly being ranked among top 100 institutions of India. The institute is also being ranked among top 50 private institutions of India by ARIA, that is, utter ranking of institutions on innovation achievements, with more than 125 companies visiting college every year for campus recruitment. College has maintained the placement ratio of 86% campus placements through all the years. We are proud to put on record that we have placed a student, Mr. Rahul Mai, from BTEC Computing Engineering internationally in Emirates, Dubai, with a salary package of 35 lakhs per year. One of our students, Mr. Tanish Jain from BTEC Computer, has been selected as a TABU student ambassador internationally. Saturday at BB is a program arranged for students to have a direct interaction with industrial experts which opens an opportunity to hear a direct first-hand information about the recent developments and expectations of industry from students by the experts in, across the industry and the peers in the society. This activity is a step forward by our principal, sir, Dr. Anand Balarao, for bridging the gap between the industry and academia. We all talk a lot about the gap between the industry and academia. So this is one of the initiative to bridge this particular gap so that students will be employable and ready to get the job offer. For today's session of Saturday at PV, we have with us an eminent personality, Dr. Gautam Chattopadhyay, sir. He is having more than 350 publications in international journals and more than 15 patents in his name. He also received more than 35 NASA Technical Achievement and New Technology Invention Awards. He received the IEEE. To you, to all the students, I would like to mention that IEEE is the highest and the most standard uh, uh, journal and the organization where a research has been published. So, he received the IEEE Region 6 Engineer of the Year Award in 2018. He was a recipient of Best Journal Paper Award in 2013 by IEEE Transactions on Terahertz Science and Technology. Best Paper Award for Antenna Design and Applications at European Antennas and Propagation Conference. I hope all these students have muted themselves. Please don't unmute yourself. Uh, uh, Gautam sir is uh, a recipient of a Best Journal Paper Award in 2020 by IEEE Transactions on Terahertz Science and Technology. To name you, there are, uh, if I can have a good time, I can enlist a ma many more uh, achievements by Gautam sir. But more than me, students, you will be uh, more than happy to listen from him. So with this note, may I now welcome Gautam, sir, to uh, the today's program at Saturday at BV. Uh, virtually, we can have a small uh, round of applause to Gautam, sir, for uh, this particular, his valuable time. And I would like to make a note over here that we are sitting in India and here we are at Sitting at 10, around 10.15, yes, 10.13 a.m. But there in California, he is at his uh, night and uh, uh, the time will be somewhere around 9.45 in the night. So, sir, I would like to mention a special thanks for your... Uh, students, please unmute 
don't unmute yourself keep yourself on a mute and uh, over to you gautam sir so uh, you can start with the presentation and in last 10 minutes we can take up the questions thank you sure. thanks and nice day thank you very much uh, nachiket and i really want to thank all of you who have uh, you know come in and uh, early in the morning on a saturday and <laughs> to listen to me and yeah as, as nachiket said it's about 9:45 pm here uh, the, so i had a long day but whenever i get an opportunity to talk to students i am always excited uh, so um, I hope uh, you know I, I'm going to keep a lot of time for questions so that you can ask questions uh, related to my work and whatever is bothering you. Not necessarily that I have all the answers, but at least we can discuss some of these questions and see you know where we can go. So uh, let me start. Uh, so I'm sharing my screen, and I hope you can see my screen. Yes, can you it is my screen. OK, so yes. um, so uh, I was thinking what to talk uh, to you all. So in, in a way, um, the best way to talk to you about what we do in NASA. So what exactly we are after? Of course, you all know that we do a lot of different missions, space missions, and we develop a lot of uh, new technologies. But at the heart of everything is what we are trying to do is trying to find out a, a question that uh, answer to a question is, are you alone in this universe? Is there life outside our planet Earth? So that is the question, you know, bothers a lot of us. And we are trying to find an answer to that. And I will give you a glimpse of what do I mean by that and what I think about it. So let's start. So before we start, I want to acknowledge uh, my uh, team. Uh, you can see that we have about 24 members in my team and they, looking at the faces, you realize that they come from all over the world. And that's one of the reason NASA has been so successful because we, diversity makes NASA get great. That's what I believe and that's what a lot of people believe because we get the best and the brightest from all over the globe and they want to come to our organization and work. So sometimes, you know, I, I feel really lucky that I'm surrounded by people who are much, much smarter than I am. And that's one of the, you know, key to uh, success uh, of me as well as a lot of other people that uh, if you want to be successful, surround yourself with smart people around you and then you cannot go wrong. Uh, so a little bit about NASA and JPL. Uh, NASA has a lot of different centers all across the United States. Our headquarters is actually in Washington, D.C., but I am here in Pasadena, California, on the other side uh, of the country. And JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, is actually one of the largest NASA laboratories, and we do uh, robotic missions. You hear about, you know, uh, you know missions to Mars, uh, you know, the rover that is on its way uh, to Mars. We actually developed and designed and developed in our lab. So I'll talk a little bit about that. So let's start. And so this is the history of our universe, uh, the Big Bang Theory. This is not the Big Bang Theory that you watch on TV, you know, Sheldon Cooper and others. This is a real Big Bang Theory. And then what you see here that we know the age of the universe is of the order of, you know, 13.85 billion years. So we believe that this universe started with the Big Bang and then eventually all there is a rapid expansion at the beginning. And then uh, we are here where, you know, all the stars and galaxies, all these things are formed. And it turns out that the first light of this universe actually came out about after 380,000 years after the Big Bang. So initially, no light came out, even though there are a lot of radiations, but it was a hot, big plasma and it scattered light scattered inside in such a way that no light came out. And the first light that came out in 380,000 years after Big Bang is called cosmic microwave background signal. And it, that is an interesting story how it was discovered. Actually, two uh, engineers and scientists from AT&T Bell Labs in the US, they were doing some millimeter experiments and uh, you know some communication experiments. 
And why they were doing those experiments, uh, they were finding that in, a, in the receiver, they were getting some extra noise. You know, on your phone sometimes that you hear that extra hiss, that noise. So that, that kind of thing was happening to the receiver. And wherever they looked, they're finding that the same kind of noise is coming. And they had a very sensitive receiver, so they couldn't understand what is going on. Uh, you know, if, you know, sometimes what do we do? We do some experiments in our lab and we, some, we cannot explain something, then we think that it must be the, it must be experimental error. But those scientists, they are Penzias and Wilson, uh, two very famous uh, you know, scientists, they thought, hmm, we cannot explain. Let's go and talk to some physicists. So they went and talked to some physicists and the physicists told him, told them that it was the first light of the universe. Most probably they were detecting that. So they went back and did some more experiments and guess what? For their discovery, they got the Nobel Prize. So next time you are in your lab and doing some experiments and you cannot explain something, do not think that that could be experimental error. You know, you never know, you might win the Nobel Prize. So all this universe have, you know, that uh, this universe came about, all the stars and galaxies are formed. And then, uh, then we, this question comes that, okay, life was formed on planet Earth. So what is the possibility that life exists somewhere else? So let's uh, set uh, the baseline very clear that we have not found life anywhere else. We have not seen any alien. We have not found any aliens. Whatever you read uh, in, in all this internet or whatever you see on YouTube, do not believe if someone says that there are aliens, there is life. No, we have not even found a, li a single cell life anywhere in this universe. Only form of life we found so far is in our own planet Earth. So, however, when people ask me this question, that uh, what do I believe? Do I believe that there could be life? So you can do some back of the envelope calculations. Let's go and do that. When you look uh, in uh, in the sky, you see all these stars, right? From, uh, you know, millions and billions of stars. It turns out that in our own galaxy, that is the Milky Way galaxy, we have about 100 billion stars. That is, you know, 10 to about uh, 11 is 100 in this universe, there are about 100 billion galaxies, which means in our universe, we have about 10 to about 22 stars. And we are finding that increasingly are finding that majority of those stars, they have planets around them. And not only one, they are multiple planets. We call them exoplanets. We, and then if you think about it, that what is the probability or amongst these trillions and trillion stars and trillions and zillions of planets, there is one planet where the conditions are such that life can exist. The probability has to be very finite, right? So that's what we are actually trying to find out. And when we are looking for the planets and then trying to find out if they, uh, you know, there is life in those, something called planets in a habitable zone, because the planet could be of different kinds, right? So think about that on my screen, you can see that we act, we know that we actually go, uh, you know, very often you go back to Mars. Now we are going to Mars again. And the reason we go to Mars, because it turns out that in its early history, Mars resembles quite a lot of our, like our own planet Earth. So question we are actually trying to answer is that was Mars ever habitable? That was there life on Mars ever? Or does Mars have life now? So these are the questions we are actually trying to answer. And if I, this is the picture actually I show a lot of times that if I tell you that this picture, you know, right now this uh, monsoon rains are going on in a lot in India. So if I tell you that this is actually one of the roads from you know some parts of India uh, in the monsoon season, you might agree. Uh, but this picture actually is taken on Mars. So I want you to pay attention to the terrain that's shown on this picture. You, we get this kind of terrain only when there is flowing water. So which means on Mars at some point of time we had flowing water. 
But when if we go to Mars today, we actually don't see flowing water. We find water a little bit in under the ground, but we don't see that. So question is what happened? Where did that water go? And can it happen to our own planet? And what can we do to prevent it? So these are very important questions that we are searching answers for. So we actually have been sending rovers to Mars to understand some of it. So there's a rover that we sent Pathfinder 1996 that was really kind of small. And then we sent two twin rovers, Spirit and Opportunity in 2003. And then 2011, we sent Curiosity. And now in 2020, we sent uh, the Perseverance rover on July 30th. We, uh, we launched that and it's going to arrive on Mars uh, in February 2021. It takes about six to seven months to actually reach uh, to Mars. So it is not very easy and it's not very easy to land on Mars. You know that a lot of countries, uh, they have tried but has not been successfully landing because it's not that they're not capable is because it's really, really hard to land on Mars. So this is a Perseverance Mars Rover 2020. Uh, it has a lot of uh, really cool instruments uh, so that it will do all these kinds of experiments. There is a drill uh, that will drill hole in, um, uh, in rocks and will you know, do a lot of measurements. Uh, it will scoop material from the ground and do uh, in experiments and it has a lot of different kinds of cameras. There is one also that will actually generate oxygen uh, from the atmospheric carbon dioxide that is there uh, in the air. So this will, be, uh, you know, we'll do a lot of different new experiments out there uh, on this. So this is Mars Rover 2020 Perseverance Rover just before it was packed and sent to Florida for launch. This is in our lab. So you can see that the real size, how it looks like. So uh, and um, so it is on its way. Let's hope for the best. So I want to show this picture. Actually, this picture was taken uh, by Mars Rover Curiosity. Uh, that was, you know, uh, in when uh, it landed on Mars. Uh, what you are seeing here is this small dot is the Earth. If you expand it, you can see the moon as well. Uh, so this, our uh, planet Earth was captured or pictured from the surface of another planet. You know, all of us work in the lab, we build small things, but it is very important that what we do is, in, uh, is not trivial. And, you know, maybe we are working on a very small thing, but in the, if you look at the big picture, these things are very important because, you know, some of us actually worked on this and it it went with Mars Rover Curiosity, carried it to another planet and it's sending back this kind of picture. So that is really very exciting. But I am showing this for another reason. And the reason is that, you know, sometimes we think that we are very smart. We know everything. There is nothing more to learn and all this. We have a lot of egos. And uh, however, you know, when uh, you you know next time you feel that way, you should think about this picture because in the big scheme of things, we are just a dot in the sky. That's how we look like from another planet. So hopefully, uh, this that thought will ground you. And you know, for electrical engineers, grounding is very very important. So that uh, that's why I show this uh, this picture. And I was talking to you about these exoplanets that you know there are lots of planets out there in this universe. So far, we have actually found uh, in more than 4,000 exoplanets, and they're all different sizes and shapes. You can see that we have found quite a few of them which are like gas giants, like Jupiter, and also some of them are like rocky planets like our Earth. So when you are looking for uh, a planets and looking for life, we look for planets which we call in the habitable zone. Habitable zones are that, you know, planets where the temperature is such that water can exist in the liquid form on the surface. Uh, then you might ask why we look for water. The reason is that when you're looking for life, we are looking for life, uh, the kind of life that we know about, like carbon-based life, which needs water, which needs oxygen. 
So we are finding that there are quite a few planetary systems which are in the habitable zone. That they, their temperature is such that actually water can exist there in the liquid form on the surface. However, majority of them are quite far from us. Uh, you know, like, you know, four light years away. And if you think about it, if with the current day technology, if you have to go to those planets, it will take millions of years to reach there, which means that we won't be able to actually go there and find out if there is life. So we'll have to do experiments. We'll have to build instruments sitting here and sending in the outer space. So that is one of the challenges. And you might ask me that, okay, I told you that there are trillions and trillions of stars and zillions of uh, you know, planets out there, then why did we find only 4,000 planets? The reason is we only looked into very narrow areas of our own galaxy, Milky Way galaxy. We have not really seen, uh, explored much yet. The reason is we don't have the technology to actually look far and you know, see in all the details about what's going on. So uh, as our technology improves, we'll be able to see more and more uh, and we'll be able to find out you know, is there is habitable planets and is there any atmosphere in those planets? One of the question is, how do you find these planets? So well, that is one of the challenges that, you know, is very, very difficult uh, to actually find these planets, these exoplanets. You know, I'll show you uh, in a te two techniques that we use to find planets, you know, in the, outside our solar system. Uh, one of the things is that, you know, if the planet is going around the sun, the star, in the way that is shown on the right side, right top side of my screen, then uh, we'll be able to see that planet. But if it is going around the other way on the left side, then in our line of sight, then we'll miss it. We'll be able to detect it. So what, how we do that is suppose we want to find out if there is any planet around the star. First, we'll have to isolate that star from all the other stars that is out there. So you isolate that and try to detect the total amount of light that is actually coming from the star. Again, this is far off place, which means your detectors has to be really sensitive to detect the faint amount of light that is coming from the star. And then if there is a planet, and it's when the planet goes in front of that star, the total light, and from there we can say, oh, there is a planet. And then looking at the time it takes to actually go in front of it and looking, the, uh, looking at the gravitational effects and everything, we can learn a lot about that planet. We can say whether what is the density of that. Is this a rocky planet or is it a gaseous planet? What is the size? What is the orb, orbit, orbit, orbit time? So a lot of things we can understand uh, about that planet. Uh, by looking at this kind of experiment. But again, I want to emphasize this is not easy to detect. Uh, these planets are you know, outside their far off places. So another way we do is called you know, Doppler effect. So, uh, so here you can see that you know, if you're looking at one of the lights coming from the star and you can translate that in frequency as the planet goes in front and away from that star due to Doppler effect that frequency shifts. By measuring the shift in frequency, we'll be able to tell that there is a planet going around that star. So we, we can we have a lot of technique that we can use to actually find out. So, but again, as I was saying, one of the things that we are looking for, we are searching for is water. That you know what? Is there enough water out there to sustain life? And the answer is yes. We are finding that like sun-like very young stars they have water in there and the water is coming out at a very fast rate at 200,000 kilometer per hour. It's a huge speed. This is 80 times faster than a bullet from AK-47 rifle. But if something travels that fast, it tries to destroy itself because it generates heat. However, the conditions are such that actually finds a way to recombine and generate huge amount of water. How much? 100 million times more water then the total amount of water in the Amazon river is created per second in one of these stars, which means that this universe is actually flooded with water. There's lots of water out there. So if the water is there, can life be far behind? So that is the question. I'll talk about the uh, instrument that we are building. So I'll talk about that later, but these are the science question, uh, you know. And another science thing is that when our earth was formed, there's no water. And scientists believe that 
the comets brought water to Earth. So if I tell you that, you might ask me, you know, as an engineer, as an engineer, as a scientist, as a human being, you know, the, the thinking and smart human being, you will always, you should always ask this question. If I say that, you know, comets brought water to art, you should ask how? Prove it to me. What are you going to, how are you going to prove that actually that is the case, right? Because we ask this kind of questions. So how we can prove about, you know, how do you know, how can I explain is this, that water uh, has different kinds of water actually. It's not one kind of water. That water that we drink every single day is one kind of water, is H2O. You no, know, oxygen has different isotopes. The most stable isotope of oxygen is 16, or O16. So H2O16O is the most common water that we drink. However, there are other kinds of water, H2O17O, H2O18O and HDO, one hydrogen, one deuterium, and one oxygen also forms water. And we all know about heavy water, D2O. So it turns out that if you take the ratio of the abundances of all different kinds of water and compare what we have on Earth to some of these comets, you find out there are a lot of similarities. And if they're similar, then the source has to be the same. So that we actually try to measure the D, that deuterium over hydrogen ratio of that water that we have, then we can compare with comets and we can, can say that they came from the same source. So currently, actually, I am building some instruments, some mission I'm working on that we will, very small instrument in a shoebox size satellite, we call CubeSat, and we'll be sending it to a comet and then try to find out, we may do this measurement, the D over H ratio, on the water on the comets, the comets actually carry a lot of water. And then try to see that, okay, can we really prove this theory that uh, our water has come from our comets? Now, we are talking about finding lives outside our solar system, you know, far off places, but can life exist in our own solar system other than our planet Earth? So the ans answer is, there is a pot there is possibility like what you are seeing here is uh, Saturn's moon Enceladus. You know it is a very cold body, but what we have discovered with the instrument called HiFi on Herschel Space Observatory. Actually, I was involved in building that instrument. Uh, this on an astronomy mission, and we found that Enceladus actually raining water out. If you expand on this, that's what you can see here. That is actually water gushing out. And, you know, water gushing out from a cold body, which means that, that inside there has to have a source of energy. Otherwise, what is making, uh, melting, what is melting the water in there, right? And the question is, uh, from there, is there any organic materials? Is there any life forming material? Because if there is water, if there is source of energy, that is possibility of life. So we have, are actually thinking about, you know, sending a mission to Enceladus to find out what else is coming out. Is there any organic or life material coming out from there? So another place where life can exist, uh, we believe is Europa. Europa is a moon of Jupiter. And we actually believe that there is a, you know, this is a very cold planet and there is a thick ice shell outside. However, we by doing a lot of measurements, we think there is a liquid water ocean underneath this ice. This ice actually is about 15 to 100 kilometers thick. And if there is a liquid water ocean, that has to be a mantle like our own earth, where that is keeping this water liquid. That means there is a source of energy. The question is, is there life in this liquid water ocean in Europa? Suppose I know I come to you, all, to all, all the students and ask you that, okay, we are planning a mission to Europa and then what kind of instrument you are going to build to find out if there is life in this water ocean? The obvious answer is uh, we can send a drill, we drill a hole, lower a bucket and see if any fish or anything comes out. No, I'm a Bengali, so I like fish. Uh, so uh, the problem is that, that we cannot do that. It takes seven years to go to Europa. On top of that, when we have a mission like that, the total amount of power 
that we available to us is about 300 to 400 watts. You know, 300 to 400 watts is three to four light bulbs. So what kind of hole you can drill through ice on, on a planet that is uh, planetary body that is seven years away and you have to drill 15 to 100 kilometers through ice. We cannot do that, right? So what else can we do then? It turns out that there's a lot of <coughs> cracks on these ice and these materials actually leak out all the way to the top. But since it's so cold, when it goes to the top, it freezes. And however, you know, Europa is very close to Jupiter and Jupiter has very high magnetic field. And that means a very high radiation. And the radiation actually takes all the material on the top surface and throws out in the atmosphere. So we are actually trying to build instruments to go there and see that what, what is there in that material that is coming out, is that in organic materials, is that in life materials there or not. So that's what we are actually, that NASA is planning a mission to go to Europa to act, answer this question. That is very exciting. Now, these are the, you know, science thing that we are trying to do, the basic science things we are trying to do. Then what kind of instrument we can do? Because I know all of you, many of you are engineers, so that question you will be asking. So let's look into that, a little bit about the technology aspect of it. So whenever we are doing a planetary mission, one of the things that we'll have to do is make everything small, less mass, and you should draw less amount of power. So to do that, you know, to shrink it down, we'll have to, we have been very successful in shrinking things down. If you all know that this is the first IC that we developed in 1960, which had only about three to four transistors. But nowadays, we build ICs, which has billions of transistors. And it turns out we are producing about 10 to the power 19 transistors per year. That is about 1,000 transistors per every ant on planet Earth. I don't know why I put these uh, statistics, but that's interesting. But most of these circuits work. However, just building an IC is not enough because you have to build an instrument to do all these kinds of you know experiments. So if you think about it, so 1917, this radio transmitter was such a big instrument think think about it one human being is standing here you know what is shown here on top right that is iphone 5's entire circuit so uh, all of you uh, must be having a uh, you know a smartphone with you have you ever opened a, your yeah. smartphone so if you have not you should and i actually opened my wife's iphone uh, okay, uh, there's water damage to that. That's why I opened uh, her phone. Uh, but why I'm showing this? Because if you look at this, this is actually a piece of art. This engineering, kind of engineering that has been done is amazing. So there are a lot of these ICs and how they're interconnected, how, you know, that all these small connectors, all these, you know, the circuit assemblies, amazing. And we are actually taking advantage of those developments and building instruments, space instruments, to go take it uh, out. I think someone is, uh, someone's microphone is on. Can you start it off? Yes. Can you take it? Everyone, please mute yourself. Everyone, please mute yourself. Hello. Is, uh, on. Yom, Yom, Yom Gupta. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, so the, we are actually taking advantage of this kind of developments and trying to build instruments which are small, uh, you know, very highly integrated, low mass. We are also building CubeSats. It, actually, a lot of students are doing a lot of CubeSat development all over the globe. You all can build a CubeSat. CubeSat is shoebox site satellite. You know, they go in the unit of one U. One U stands for 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter. A very small box, but most of the time, if you want to really make an instrument out of that, it needs about six U, that 30 centimeter by 20 centimeter by 10 centimeter. Uh, and NASA has, is building, we are working on a lot of that. And there are already quite a few CubeSats out there in outer space and many are more are planned. One of the first CubeSat that went to Mars is called Marco, Mars CubeSat 1. It was developed for a specific uh, need.
because when you go to Mars, when you land on Mars, there is for seven minutes, there is no direct communication to planet Earth. So we don't know whether our spacecraft has landed or not. We have to wait for seven minutes. On top of that, it takes seven minutes for signal to reach uh, to Earth from Mars at the speed of light. So you can, from there, you can calculate uh, what is the distance between Mars and Earth. So to uh, you know, avoid that, that there is no communication, what we did is that we built this six U CubeSat in the, the shoebox side satellite. And as the inside spacecraft was going to the Mars surface, it we released these two uh, you know, CubeSats and it had uh, two different uh, receiver system. One was UHF transmission that communicated with this spacecraft and then got the data and sent it back to Earth. So that's it, it worked really well. And another thing that we have developed recently is called, you know, a rain cube. Rain cube is actually a radar instrument on a CubeSat. Again, it's a 6U CubeSat, but it has a large antenna. This is a for, you know, 50 centimeter antenna. One of the question is, how do you fit in a 50 centimeter antenna in a small 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter volume? So that is really challenging, but we actually overcame. We designed something that a deploying antenna, it, that's what it shows after it's deployed. And it actually worked very well. Uh, RainCube is right now uh, taking data, sending data, the radar instrument. And I'll show you a video that shows how we actually deploy a very simple mechanism, a spring loading loaded structure. But we had to do you know, a lot of innovation. You can see here when the spring is released, what happens is this deploying uh, parabolic dish antenna it deploys, it opens up, and the sub reflector will deploy as well. So that's how it works. This is a 50 centimeter diameter, you know, uh, mesh antenna working at 35 gigahertz. This is a KA band antenna. So we had to again. So one of the things that in NASA we have to do is we've always faced challenges but you'll have to come up with innovative solutions. And that's why we actually put our head together and then we came up with this solution and it worked really well. And then we are also building all different new kinds of antenna. This antenna is a, a 3D printed all metal antenna. We call it a meta surface antenna. This again uh, is working at 35 gigahertz and this is flat. You know, the thickness of this antenna is 1.5 millimeter very very thin uh, you know you call it low profile antenna idea is that this antenna can go on the side wall of that cube side that we saw so you won't have to have this deploying the you know, reflector antenna this will work as well so the side of the spacecraft will work as an antenna so this is what i am working on i call it uh, i named it for kid bed antenna because this looks like metal pins and you know that you know in Saint uh, Indian Saints for kids, they used to sleep on a uh, bed of nails. That's why I call for kid bed, and people uh, you know like that name. Uh, so we, I am building an instrument. I was saying that we are actually working on a lot of new innovative ideas here for very small satellites. And as uh, I was mentioning that I'm working on an instrument that will go to a comet to answer that question on water. So I named it Water Hunting Advanced Terahertz Spectrometer on Ultra Small Platform. The acronym is fun. It's called WhatsApp because the reason I came up with this acronym is that we are trying to answer what's up with water. What is going on with water? Did uh, you know comets brought water to Earth? So that's what we are doing. I this is a little bit of technical here that what how the block diagram looks like, what exactly is happening. And, you know how we measure this is that. Uh, it is called spectroscopy, very high resolution spectroscopy. You can see that all these different water has different frequencies associated with them. So we can measuring those at different frequencies, we'll be able to tell how, what is the abundances and we can take the ratios of a D over H. <clears throat> so again, the new kinds of antennas that I'm working on, that is a new MEMS structure is there. And so you have to do a lot of innovations. We are also doing SOCs. Some of you know that SOCs are uh, you know, system on a chip. 
This is silicon CMOS based structure. It's iPhone technology or you know your smartphone technology. Using that, we actually are developing those things, designing those ourselves, and then building, uh, putting instrument together, which is very low mass and low power, but highly capable. And that can do all these kinds of stuff. And this is a picture of that instrument uh, uh, that I have uh, built and getting, getting tested right now. Uh, you can see here the size of this instrument that will go to a, a comet. Is a, this is a penny. So it, this entire instrument weighs less than two kilograms and weighs less than five, uh, takes, uh, needs less than five watts of power. If you compare the before I did this, uh, uh, you know, we did this, the instrument that similar kind of instrument that are performing same way, it is to weigh more than 25 kilograms and is to draw more than 100 watts of power. So we have made huge difference by innovating, you know, coming up with new ideas and building this kind of instrument. So I will end, uh, I last two slides, I'll show about the Mars helicopter. Many of you already know that for the, with the, you know, uh, Perseverance rover, we are sending a helicopter as well called Ingenuity. And the question is, why are you sending a helicopter to Mars, right? So the reason is that, you know, it takes, as I said, it takes about seven to eight minutes for signal to reach to Mars from Mars. So we cannot really drive the rover sitting it here, you know, online driving, you cannot really do. How it works is we first, you know, have some idea about which are the areas the rover should go and look into, do the experiments. Then we upload all this, you know, the, this uh, software that where it will go, all the instructions for the rover, and then the rover goes around. It's actually one of the most expensive self-driving car uh, because it drives on its own, but it has a lot of different things, obstacle avoidance and all. But, you know, it has limited, because it can go only limited, uh, you know, places. So idea of the helicopter is, if the helicopter will be sitting on that rover, and then after it reaches there, it will take off, it has a lot of cameras, it has a lot of, you know, other sensors. So it will go around and, you know, look around what are interesting areas, send the data back to the rover and then rover and decide to go some places. So that's why we are, you know, uh, we are sending the helicopter. But what is that? What are the challenges of this helicopter? The problem is that, you know, that when we have a helicopter on Earth, uh, the blades that the rotating blade that the helicopter has, it rotates, you know, about 400 to 600 RPM revolution per minute. But Mars atmosphere is much, much lighter compared to our Earth. As a result, to have the, you know, lift, the helicopter has to, uh, the blade has to move much, much faster, you know, 2,500 to 3,000 RPM. And that's a huge challenge, a technical challenge. So also you have to make it really lightweight, otherwise it cannot fly. So we made um, a helicopter which weighs 1.4 kilograms and it has about 220 watts of power because we have solar panels on them. And so that's what it's on its way to Mars right now. But I will end with this picture. This is the helicopter that is ready, finally, uh, you know, assembled on the rover. And it is right now it's on its way to Mars, uh, as I said, we'll reach on Mars uh, in S February 2021. Finger crossed, hope everything will go well. So that is really exciting. And with that, I will actually stop uh, sharing uh, my screen. So let's see if how to stop sh sharing. Uh, so have I stopped sharing my screen? Yes, stop sharing. Okay, so now uh, I can take questions. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thanks for such a wonderful uh, presentation and insights about the NASA and astronomy. So uh, I now open uh, officially for question and answers. Uh, students might be having a lot of questions altogether. So uh, we will take it one by one. The questions from the students, so just raise the hand. Uh, unmute yourself, go with the question and then again mute yourself. Don't forget to mute again, so it will not create a confusion. 
So anyone, just you can take it ahead. Hello. Yes. Um, good morning, teachers. This is Ishita Mishra. I had a question about the thing he and so said about the Jupiter moon, that it has an eyes of uh, around 50 to 100 kilometers of length. Mm -hmm. And how are we supposed to see whether the ocean really exists uh, underneath that or not? So okay. I had a doubt yeah. that can it's just a thought that it came to me that can we have the nuclear bombs we have on earth sent on those planets to check because i guess they are you know vast enough to create such disturbance on the plate that it can dig up to that level just so uh, so uh, so you are not the first one to ask this question to think about it <laughs> we are trying to find life on another planetary body and first thing we do is go take a nuclear weapon and uh, you know drop on that. So what what is going to happen to the life <laughs> that exists there, <laughs> if, if at all? <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Yes. So uh, so we'll have to be really you know thoughtful about this. That uh, some of the things might make sense, uh, but you know that's too dangerous. On top of that, think about it: the nuclear power. When you take a uh, you know a nuclear thing. Uh, as I said, we cannot carry a lot of mass. We cannot carry a lot of power. So that is also one of the problems that it will, on top of that, if you are carrying a nuclear power during launch, something goes wrong and then it, it releases the nuclear energy and all this radiation, it will create huge. Can you imagine, uh, you know, what is going to happen and uh, what kind of uh, flak NASA is going to get <laughs> if that happens? Uh, so yes. we cannot really do a lot of things. So you'll have to think other innovative ways in a safe way. We cannot uh, do to take those kind of risks because that is too risky. Okay, sir. Thank yeah. you, sir. So there's Nilebro who has raised the hand, so you can ask Nilebro. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, first of all, thank you for such a interesting I cannot hear you. Your voice is not audible, uh, Nilabro. Please. Uh, Nilabro, your voice is not clear. Please, if you could uh, recheck with your mic. Uh, till then, can we you just take... Yeah. But I just wanted to ask that uh, mm -hmm. why we don't have, why we haven't planned any manned mission to Mars, just like we have landed man. Uh, Human beings on the moon, why we haven't thought of landing human beings on Mars? So, I, 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 you can be the first person uh, to go to Mars, no problem. Problem is <laughs> that the technology that we have, we can take someone to Mars. Uh, however, we cannot bring them back. <laughs> so, it is a one way ticket uh, because we cannot bring, you know, that it, it does not, technology does not exist today to send some person to Mars and bring them back home safely. So that's why we have not sent anyone to Mars yet. So if uh, the technologies, you know, to develop this kind of technologies, we need uh, a lot of money. And so if there is enough investment, but we are working on it and hopefully one day uh, man will be on Mars, uh, but we, we are not there yet. Thank you very much. Uh, next is Tanishk. Tanish, you can ask the question. Uh, good morning, sir. So my question is that you said we don't have enough power in the drills to dig up holes that deep. So, sir, so why don't we use solar energy from sun? Yeah. Okay. You know, uh, you are talking about Jupiter. Uh, you know how far Jupiter is. Amount of if you if, when you are trying to generate solar power on planet Earth, you know that you know that is a uh, kind of efficiency of the solar panels and the size of the solar panel that you need to generate uh, uh, the amount of power. And we are, the, you know, our distance from sun is very close. When you go to Jupiter, amount of solar light that is reaching there is almost, you know, very, very low amount. Mm -hmm. So as a result, you cannot really generate enough power from your solar panels. On top of that, the size of the solar panels 
uh, that you will need is huge, which means that you have to carry those mass. It all comes back to that. Sir, can't so we store that energy? Like, say it again. For, sir, can't we store that energy for like if we are traveling in space? For for that period, it can store that energy, and when it reaches there, it can use that energy. So uh, to store that energy, you have to store it in a battery, right? Where do you store yeah, yeah. them? And you know, to uh, you know, do you have a battery at home? If you think about it, you know, a lot of people in India they have these inverters. Have you seen the size of battery that you need? And then, yeah. how much does it weigh? So it uh, yeah. all comes down to those things, you know, that you know, engineering, uh, practical aspects of it. Thank you, sir. Okay. So next is Harsh. Uh, Subhi. Yeah. Yes, yes, Harsh. Sir, I wanted to ask that is Kalam set uh, considered to be a QSAT? Uh, can can you say it again? Is Kalam set considered to be the QSAT, meaning Kalam set the smallest satellite? A uh, smallest satellites is called you know uh, you can call it nano satellites as well, but CubeSats are a specific kind of satellites. They are they go by the unit of that I talked about U one U, the ten centimeter by ten centimeter by ten centimeter. So uh, this is kind of for standardizations. So these are very small satellites. Okay. So, uh, but the smallest satellite is also the size of uh, a smallest cubesat. That is one U. So, yes. will that make a difference uh, in classification? Uh, no, not really, because you know it will depend on one. You can say, okay, I'm sending a one U satellite. That's fine. But it turns out that you know one U is amount of space that you have. That these satellites will have to fly on their own. So you'll have to have some propulsion system. You'll have to have some power system. It has to have antennas to whatever data it takes. It has to send it back. So how do you fit all of those things in a one U? So most often, to be a really useful satellite. That one you we find is not enough, uh, so you'll have to make it slightly larger size. So we found that to do any scientific exploration, the minimum size satellite that you actually need is of the order of six u, so that you can actually go. It has enough propulsion. It has it needs to have a star tracker so that it knows where it is, right? And it has to point to whichever direction. So it needs some antennas to collect data, instruments, and then. It needs a communication system to send the data back. So if you put everything together, you'll find that you need a little bit more than one U. Correct. I hope all the students who are asking and also the attendees are noting with the questions and the answers. So it will be a residue for your uh, uh, as a knowledge database altogether. So we'll take a couple of two three questions uh, from uh, and. Uh, Anmol is there. He has raised hand, and then we have Abhi. Yes, yeah. Anmol, you can take it. Uh, sir, good morning, sir. I wanted to ask about uh, Europa. Mm -hmm. Sir, uh, can we send radiation beneath the surface and then analyze it for organic material? Uh, radio. What kind of radiation you mean? You know, uh, beneath like the surface. Like sonar. Uh, like sonar. Uh, sonar. You know that again. You can take a sonar instrument to see. You, you will be able to see what is underneath, but you know how to detect the existence of any, uh, you know, life. Again, sonar uh, will print it, but you have to understand there's actually 15 to 100 kilometers deep this ice. Yes, right? <laughs> so again, if you start thinking about the details of what you need uh, to take there to build an instrument that will look through that, we have radar, right? You know, we we can take ground penetrating radar, but at the same time. Yeah, you need a lot of power because when you have to to penetrate this ice that is 15 to 100 kilometers, it is not easy at all. If you start putting the numbers that what kind of power that we need to transmit uh, for that radar and also for sonar, uh, it actually gets really large. So it's not easy. So all these easy solutions that we can think of most often, you know, uh, it's not practical. practical. We'll have to think about what are the requirements and what can we do, does, you know, that is one of the things that you, you know, these are very good questions and I'm, I'm not, you know, trying to, uh, you know, minimize them. 
However, if when you start thinking about them, the implementation part, then you realize that there are a lot of challenges. Okay. Yes, sir. correct. So, Abhigyan is next one. Abhigyan. Let's take it sir, out. Abhigyan. Good morning, sir. Yes, yes. Good uh, I want to ask about the article which I have read tomorrow about uh, yesterday about the uh, the scientists are uh, sir, researching about the uh, other type of virus which are not found on the earth on the comets. So, can you tell about some uh, something about that? So, I, I, I don't know where you read it, uh, but if virus, you know, there are many kinds of virus. One, uh, are they living viruses? If they're living viruses, that is not uh, uh, a credible uh, report. Because as I said, we have not found, uh, you know, life, living uh, or virus or anything, any living organism uh, anywhere else. So uh, I, I don't really know, uh, you know, about that article. Uh, but what we know so far that we have not found any form of living, even a single cell uh, outside, not in a comet, not in an asteroid, not in any planetary bodies not in any moon, uh, so nowhere else. Correct. Abhishek Dubey, you can take the question or raise the hand. Uh, yeah, sir, good morning, sir. Uh, talking about the Mars helicopter, uh, as we know that uh, Mars atmosphere is uh, very thin and uh, compared to the Earth. So what were the real challenges faced by NASA in building the helicopter? Oh, yes. The, you know, there are a lot of challenges from different aspects of it. So if you think about the mechanical aspect of it, that you'll have to make um, these blades and the entire um, helicopter with material that has to be very light material. So that's one of the challenges, the mechanical aspect of it. And then from the electrical, uh, electronic, electric aspect of it, that we had to put antennas and stuff like that on, on the helicopter so that the one, once the helicopter takes data, and it has to send back to the rover, right? And it turns out, I'll give you, an, uh, you know, that interesting thing that we actually were working on that some antennas, and we found that oh, perfect, we designed some antenna to work beautifully, and then we realized when uh, they, the mechanical engineers they build that uh, blades of that antenna, they use some kind of carbon fiber materials, it behaves more like a metal. So you all know, some of you are electrical engineers on this, you know that. If you have a some metal structure around your antenna, it behaves like a Faraday cage, and it actually stops your, it messes up your radiation pattern of the antenna. So we are having a lot of difficulties. So then we talked with the mechanical guys, and we are, this is one of the things that you have to work in a group, you know, because a lot of people are involved in a lot of aspects of uh, one of the, the designs. Then we work with them to so that we could place our antenna in such a way that there will be some impact on the radiation pattern, uh, but at, that is minimized. So these are all this stuff. And then how do you minimize mass? You know, how, how much power, how much battery you can put in uh, storage so that it can actually fly for some time and take data. So these all these uh, things has to optimized and come together. So there are a lot of challenges for sure. Uh, okay, sir, okay. there's one follow-up. There's one follow-up question, yeah. sir. Uh, so yeah. as we know, uh, as we know, uh, there's uh, very much latency uh, between Mars and Earth. So yes, uh, the think, helicopter is uh, automatically controlled. No helicopter. Is, we are not controlling the helicopter from Earth because this is again this is a self-driving helicopter no. so it's like a self-driving car it has in its own intelligence so that when it takes off this automatic this automatic i mean automated system it take off and go and fly and send data mm -hmm. okay quick question from piyush and harsh uh, piyush you can take it first hello good morning sir Yes. Yes. Sir, sir, uh, sir. In, in 90s, NASA NASA sent interstellar mission like Voyager 1 and 2. And sir, in, in that mission, NASA uses a radioactive element to generate power for a long time. Mm -hmm. 
sir then my my question is that sir uh, sir in europa if that we want to dig uh, then sir for, then sir for gen, then sir for generating power why we don't use radioactive element so that i i, I told you already that when, when you know is true that you know voyager has something called rtgs uh, they are at that kind of radioactive uh, the element a very small amount of radioactive materials they are in a very safe form they're called you know are uh, the rtgs that that it generates power because there is a radioactive material very small amount of material but amount of power that generates is very small and also you know we, to generate that kind of power we had to really shield everything so well that as a result it became kind of heavy so even for a small amount of power development uh, for for generation you actually land up with a huge mass because you'll have to make it safe right these are kind of battery form uh, so to take it to europa to drill that if you do your some calculations in the back of the envelope calculation that what is the amount of power that we need to make ice that is about 15 to 100 kilometers deep if you do you know think through that you'll realize that amount of material that you need is quite high and that's where the danger is and on top of that if you are trying to generate so you have to heat something up right uh, to uh, otherwise once uh, unless and until the first question like that you actually do a nuclear explosion that actually creates this hole or you need to heat up something that has with the radioactive material that will go through that and melt the ice and go all the way through then you will realize that uh, this is too risky uh, correct. Quick question from Harsh Kothari. Uh, Harsh. Uh, good morning, sir. Good morning. Sir, uh, can't you use a similar technology to boring company for drill on Jupiter? Like assemble it all differently, meaning part wise part on Jupiter. So again, you'll have to carry all those materials. As I said, it takes seven years to go to Jupiter. So we cannot really uh, make multiple trips. And then NASA has limited amount of budget. You know, we can. They will give us money. To maybe go once. Uh, we cannot go there multiple times. As as I said, each t in a in a trip, we can take only. You know, to launch one kilogram of mass in uh, the space, it costs more than a million dollar. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, that is a issue of money. There is the issue of you know what how much you can carry the technology as well mm -hmm. because we cannot really the launch vehicles that we have we cannot really launch a huge amount of mass that is going to a very outer space if you are going to just launch something to go to even you know to ISS the International Space Station or to the moon itself the moon is so much closer uh, to uh, our Earth than Mars. Or, and then or Jupiter we are talking about. So these are far, far distance. So that's where the challenge lies. Okay, okay, yes, yes. So Ishita, we will take uh, one more question from Ishita and then we can take the question in the chat box. Ishita, are you there? Yes, sir. Um, so I had a question that what amount of impact does the lack of funds causes on the space technologies we have today? So I didn't understand, Ishita. Can you repeat and uh, the question again? Sir, I wanted to ask that what amount of impact does the lack of funds causes in the space technology we have today? Like oh, where yes. could we have been and where we are today? Due oh, to that's a very good question. <laughs> that's a very good question, Ishita. And I, I, I yes, hope you know that uh, people who make decisions they hear this kind of questions so that <laughs> they can get more funds. Uh, so if you think about it, you know NASA's yearly budget is about twenty billion dollars. It might sound a lot, uh, but if you compare with the what is the uh, uh, yearly budget of United States government, is a very low percentage. Same is true for ISRO. Uh, you know ISRO's budget, if you look around. It is not much at all. So lack of funding, you know, one of the things that we have shown time and again everywhere, not only in the United States, everywhere, that if you have enough investment, 
uh, then mm -hmm. we come up with the, the technology, we come up with uh, the thing that we are working on. So as human beings, we have been really uh, resilient. We have been very good in coming up with solutions, but you need sustained investments in research, in technology developments. So that has not been there. And that is uh, that has actually pu pushed it back. Like if you asked had asked someone 20 years ago, that you know how many years it will take to send a man to Mars, man or, or woman to Mars, uh, the answer will be maybe 20 years. So a, even if you ask someone now, answer will be the same, 20 years, because there is no really sustained investment in these areas. So that actually is one of the reasons that uh, we cannot really do a lot of things that we want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, great. So, uh, what I can do Thank is you, sir. Yes. So you can all the participants now can mute themselves. And uh, Gautam sir, thanks for such a uh, brilliant uh, presentation and the answering the questions, sets of the questions of the uh, young minds, <coughs> fresh minds. Uh, this program, Saturday at DV, is an initiative by our principal, sir, Dr. Anand Bhadrao, sir. He has been dean and principal since last 15, 16 years, and uh, he has taken up very new, innovative uh, programs. And this is one of it. Uh, we even have a couple of implant training uh, initiative where internship is a part of curriculum, and we can I can name a lot of them. So now I request our principal, sir, uh, Bhadrao, sir, to share his thought and. Uh, about the views about today's presentation. Hello, sir. Uh, very good morning to you all. I hope I am no problem, audible sir. to all. Yes, sir. Clear, sir. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Very clear. Uh, right. Uh, today's uh, guest speaker, Dr. Pad, uh, training and officer, Nachikulkani. And my dear friends and members who are attending this program, I am really uh, very well pleased by Gautam's uh, very innovative, informative, and talented lecture. I was very keen in attending this lecture. So, Gautam, Dr. Gautam, please accept my sincere thanks for giving such a wonderful and excellent lecture to all our students. As you might have noted that there are more than 300 plus students attending your lecture and how they were curious, how they were interesting in attending lecture. Nachiket has stopped number of brother, but see there are number of hands raised to ask the question. And it is uh, maybe a little late night on your side. So somewhere we have to stop. So I think he has stopped in this one. My dear student, uh, see the study, Dr. So excellent presentation given to you all. This all indicates how, how deeply he has studied. Hello? Am yes, sir. Audible, about, no? yes, 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 sir. It's very clear. How, yeah, how, how, how deeply he has studied, how much expert he is in his studies, and that's the role model for we all. Gautam is scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, California Institute of Technology, and really he has enlightened all our students on these uh, topics, on what given topic of career through NASA for STM engineers. He talked about preservance of prover, how do we look plants, what is the life uh, at explanates, as well as very interesting point he has mentioned, the transit time detection method also, Doppler effect. These are very, very interesting information he has given it. Then how do we study or how do we find out or how do we search water on the planets the concept of velocity, and he has connected with the velocity of the bullet from AK-47. It's a really interesting and excellent way of uh, explaining uh, one particular point. Life on Europa was very, very interesting for me also. And what he has said is really surprising and new information to me also, that it took seven years to reach Europa 
then carrying equipment there making drills breaking that ice is really a challenging things for us and very interesting story i said that how to fit an antenna of 15 cm dimension in a 10 cm cube cap so very interesting uh, sentence he has mentioned that which is which may be a lifelong lesson for we all that in nasa we face challenges but we come up with innovative solutions that's the very very interesting statement he has made in our also in our education also we are facing lot of challenges every change gives us opportunity for the innovation so my dear student take this statement very seriously from him accept all the challenges and go for innovative solutions i request uh, as uh, dr gautam has said that in february 2021 their mars helicopter will reach uh, on mars i wish best of luck to him for all his endeavor and uh, what he has mentioned about that nasa has 20 billion dollar budget and still he said it is less that means so many ideas are there in his mind to do all these things in a different way in a excellent way gautam sir i am really uh thankful to you for giving such a excellent lecture such a excellent information and i would like to listen to you again and again from you also in future also at the same time i request one more thing kindly would you please connect other experts through your contacts so that we can invite them on on this platform of sadhir bharti vidyapit and we will connect our objective is not to make only graduates from this institute but we the society should be really full for the end so when they leave the society with the degree of engineering they should be contributory members of the society and will add something to the innovations and be part movement of this nation that is our main objective and in this one we would like to connect many experts from usa all over the world in various fields and would like to bring their knowledge to our students i hope you will help us in this matter and again once again i thankful to you for giving such a excellent innovative lecture i also i am also thankful to all my students more than 300 plus students have shown uh, interest in attending this lecture and moreover shweta nilambro then uh, abhigyan abhikshek harsh piyush ishita so many students have taken more interest ask questions that is that shows that you are interest in attending this lecture so once again thanks to uh, dr gautam thanks to all students as well as thankful to uh, i mean very uh, my sincere thanks to nachiket also who take lot of efforts in arranging some lectures and all this one because there are many ideas in my mind but we need good people like nachike who will implement such ideas and will make benefit of students thank you thank you very much thank you thank you so much dr anand and i really again i want to repeat what you said that i really want to thank nachike he contacted me on uh, linkedin and then we uh, when he asked me i immediately agreed you know i just want to tell one more thing that actually i have very close relationship with pune uh, because my wife is from pune yes. and so oh, i oh very uh, good <laughs> so i so you know uh, pune is my second home in a way uh, i'm from kolkata originally you are you are sunny you are sunny in law pune then that's correct <laughs> that's correct Uh, uh so that way so i have really got uh, you know uh, very you know uh, close connection to pune and i always you know i really want to thank all the students because they are uh, they ask so many nice question good questions that means as you mentioned they are thinking about all this and the students are our future and then if we you know i always tell you all that you know we we have a tendency to run after marks 
that you know how much how many marks we are getting in our exam and all but you know instead of focusing on marks if you focus on understanding the subject understanding of the basics uh, that is the best way we can learn and we can contribute uh, so again thank you so much uh, it has been a great pleasure to talk to you all and yeah. if, um, I'm, yeah. of course if I, I i go to pune on a regular basis but because of covid 19 that i'm not able to go so in future i'll be more than happy to mm -hmm. talk to you all again uh, and as you uh, dr anand you yes, mentioned sir. that i will certainly you know talk to other people and ask them to uh, join in uh, in some in future webinars thank you oh thank you thank you very much thank you sir thanks thanks a lot so, so uh, we will now uh, officially conclude the session. Uh, Gautam sir, uh, what I will do, I will uh, take the questions uh, from back end and I will compile them and then share you across on a mail and uh, then I can share the answer from you so that it will be uh, uh, knowledge which will be shared and the queries which are there in the minds of the students also be clear. So I, I can say good night. Have a nice weekend, sir. Oh, thank <laughs> and you. Thanks. And you have a great Saturday. Okay. Thanks, sir. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you to uh, principals. He's always been inspiring and motivation to all of us. And we are just implementing the best of the best ideas from him. And uh, I hope similar uh, enthusiasm will be there from the students, from the faculty members, and every element, I can say, of the Bharti Vidyapit. Thank you. Thanks a lot, sir. See you again, sir. Okay. <laughs> Bye.